Jesus knows strangers of the hour, and you guys are in for a treat. Jane Porter. So I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel off of this. This is just a spoken word piece uh, that I worked on the last uh, three weeks. Boys, paint me what ain't me. What is you? Real men, I miss you. And what I thought we were, Antoine, I fought Fisher. I'm not a good listener, but I'm listening. Boys, paint me what ain't me and what's in you that's missing. I'm sick of dressing in the skin of the aggressor. Lily White, Mr. Missing Emotional Release. His bullets are kissing innocents in the streets, in our schools, in our theaters, in suited up new schools and bottom theaters. Listen, fear ain't a leader. I hear fear is a good lead, though. I should take a moment to breathe or at least try to sleep, but words are overflowing, overcoming, and hovering over me. And I'm sick of dressing in the skin of the aggressor. Lily white male repressed memory of the oppressor. I guess, sir, I didn't tailor my complexion. This pale flesh I should mention comes from a woman and a man happening to meet, and that's how you get a meet. And if a me is an I, then who am I to you? Well, to you, I'm a you. And I can't quit myself from hurting over what strangers do. And I can't quit feeling so connected to you. You, the one, the one in front of the gun, yes, the one in front of the gun lives forever. Did you hear the rainfall this morning? How it washed the rooftop while you were mourning? And the wind winding up while we're in hiding? Um, um, what's left to say on the other day? Just another day, just another. And why are we fighting, my brother, my ex, my mother, my dead father, new friends, old friends? Why do we bother? We're slaughtering each other. The chatter of an automatic applaud and the audience is oddly ornery and it ought to be. The enemy's ornery because he's got to be. For any of this to make sense, his 22 caliber two cents. Was he evicted for no cause or had his rent raised? Was he a foster kid for seemingly no cause? How was he raised? Cause is meaning is lost on effect. One parent to two parents, or apparently he loved his God and he meant it, or his head had a dent in it. Asking ourselves why is a dead end in it? Or maybe it isn't, maybe not yet. From Sandy to Boston to Lafayette, I'm lost on demanding damning lines. Aurora to nickel lines. To Thurston to Santana, that man is mercilessly rat tat 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 To Cokeville to Red Lake to Orlando, why all this a man though? From Columbine to Ila Vista to West Side, eyes wide shut to our boys growing up, never really growing up. In Chattanooga, Virginia Tech, I ain't ever forget, I ain't ever forget, I ain't ever forget, I ain't ever forget. So the next piece I've been working on, uh, this novel I've been working on for the last four years since finishing my um, my novel Rabbit when that got published. Uh, it's called Rat King, and it's about a wife and a husband who are somewhat estranged because they're still grieving through the loss of their child from four years previous uh, due to uh, school shooting. So Rudy's the husband, Marty's the wife, and their son is Richie. The drive home dragged on, touch and go on the gas until Rudy came to a halt. A small group of college freshmen touted hand painted signs to the crosswalk with fervor of citizens really giving a shit. Good for them. And at last, throughout their twenties, was that the cynicism settled in and built properly? Properly? Properly. Sorry. His mind to state was right for development around thirty. Both parents decreased and a helpless sister to support. Just take whatever's left, he'd say, and I hope for your sake that'll be enough. The activists weren't budging. They shouted condemnation of a mayor with outside interests. Primaries were around the corner, and the character of the neighborhoods was being designed by out-of-state developers. That's what the kid on the megaphone said anyhow. Traffic was stuck. Rudy flipped through his CD case and popped in naked by the talking heads. On his left was the city's new shopping center. A line of cars circled a fast food establishment, and the line wrapping around the lot started from an adjacent lot. The novelty had triumphed convenience. Rudy saw a family of three in a truck. 
the baby bouncing up and down. It drooled with a vacant stare. The line in that fast food restaurant was so ludicrously long, we imagined the baby was likely born in the line. It would say its first word in that line. They would teach their child the bare necessities of the English alphabet and multiplication tables in that line. The child would make friends and load them and fall in love in that line. It would run to decipher bullshit only up to a point until it graduated and got married too soon and divorced too late in the line. It would lead its own children to the line until it died in the line. Its grandchildren would step out of the line and know nothing else except for the aimlessness of their own position and the seemingly clear trajectory of their ancestors. All of this were some stupid fast food chains grand opening. Rudy found his friend Kent, hunched over at the strip bar, over at the strip bar. Dolly, the African queen, challenged Kent to a round of cards. She said, you know, if this were strip poker, you'd be down to your whitey tights. She sat shoulder to shoulder with the drunk lug in her red thong and bra. A tattoo ran from the small of her back to up and over her right shoulder. A bowl of sombrero intermingled with a snake. The first choice she had made turning 18, coinciding with moving into her boyfriend Anthony's place and practicing on the floor in his house. These days she wasn't so skinny. Her eyes weren't so dazed. She lacked that anxious twitch in her legs. She had skipped Rudy's class years ago, but he gave her high marks for the homework she never handed in. Her test scores were higher than the other students. She wound up dropping out at the start of her senior year. And this was all years ago before Anthony's overdose and the string of high schoolers dropping like flies from a nasty head of heroin. Rudy only knew this since Kemp wouldn't drink elsewhere. Rudy sat beside her. He asked, are you responsible for this? He made a motion with his hand over his chin and neckline. My boy's all cleaned up. She put her finger to her lips. You were going to get me fired. She laid out her hand. Four of a kind. Kemp smirked. Rudy said, my word, you're going to shatter the stage in your ears with a mug like that. The bartender closed Rudy's tab out that night at 60 bucks plus some. He didn't say his goodbye since the two lovers were plenty occupied over their hundredth round. He headed home at a pace just under 20 miles per hour, swearing to himself he wouldn't drive drunk again if the good Lord and great Buddha or bless it all ensured his safety as well as on his unsuspecting soul on foot. He fumbled with the house keys and realized he was standing on the wrong porch. This was the neighbor's residence. In a matter of moments, he was standing in his own living room. His wife, Margie, was sound asleep on the couch. Her face smushed into the cushion in the same way that tiny face would peek in on them showering. Richie's quiet, Mama, or Papa. His face would pop up from beneath her bed comforter to hide in the closet behind the row of dresses. Some designed for dinner or casual wear, one for a special day, the rest for a second child, maybe someday at one point in the undefined future past. His little face would peek out from the closet during a game of hide and seek, the closet now stuffed with high stacks of unmarked boxes, everything that he was and would have been. Rudy contemplated erasing the pencil marks on the door frame of the pantry. The lines weren't going any higher. The whiskey and rum and vodka said in unison, when is it time? Each drink weighed its own opinion and his longing to try for another son and her screaming fits, her sobbing. You want to box up our child. You want to pretend like he never existed. You want to replace him like he's just another pet rabbit and what happens when that one dies? Bury me in the backyard with the others? What happens when I die? Are you going to bury me too? Tell me what happens when you die. What am I supposed to do? Don't tell me to move on. You want to move on and leave. Get out. Get the fuck. This is the next day. Rudy was a bit lit. The CD he ordered last week wasn't in yet. Not with anyone in particular, or with the inconvenience of ordering an item not being as convenient as things typically were these days. Hell, he really should consider online ordering as a permanent solution to owning the music he wanted to own. But Rudy was a romantic with the past as much as he was an advocate for new age distribution. The process of flipping through a physical catalog satiated the tangibility of his desires. He established a fair rapport with the record shop owner, the only human running the place and likely sleeping in the back room. Rudy wanted that particular CD for his afternoon drive home since he wasn't feeling the vibe of the CDs he had purchased the week prior. And when he heard the commotion in the hallway about the bathroom graffiti, 
The students shrieking and the other staff members discussing a call of emergency evacuation. He was sitting in the teacher's lounge. He was more focused on how when he sat in the break room chair with a slight front lift to it, the buttons on his shirt tugged at the fabric and pinched his belly rolls. He realized he looked thinner if he stood and just never sat. He had really become quite fat this past year, maybe not fat, just uncomfortably wider. The news crews popped in as if they had an insider. Some plant disguised as a high schooler, high schooler as if they were just around the corner salivating for the next big gun stare. Channel 2 and 4 and 12 and 13, they, in they intuited from his demeanor. He wasn't going to be of any use to their content, so his stride faced no hindrance. Rudy was in his car and down the road before it occurred to him exactly how far he had made it. A few moments past noon, he was halfway home. What a blessing. The commotion hadn't rippled too far at this point. College kids were storming downtown and Kaintai Park was bustling for a weekday. The cop cars that would hang around were absent. The school buses down from City Hall weren't packed anywhere within sight. The alert was out. Rudy rode ahead of the way. He parked in the driveway. He entered the house through his front door. The television was muted, rambling. His wife sat in the closet. Hey, saw the news? She said, hey, yeah. That robe looked like a comforter on her. He might not even fit into it at this point. She was swallowed in his leftovers, tucked between piles of her own. He laid beside her. His hand engulfed her hands. What well, Kate said, I think I'm getting fat. Her mouth erupted into a laugh as her eyes shut out a barrage of tears, and she fell into his chest with a force not unlike how she had met him with during Richie's conception. He put a hand on her stringy hair, once fuller and darker. He said, her, Are you sick? I don't know. She rolled up the robe sleeves. Showed him one, two, four of the bumps. She guided his hands to the lumps between her ribs and the ones in her, in her legs. He felt each one with an unchanged facial expression, one comprised of a scrunched brow and closed lips, silent and curious. She didn't describe any pains or concerns. She forced his touch. He felt. He traced the stretch marks beneath her label, beneath her navel, her only tattoos of a former life. He felt two lumps along her bony backside, ones even she was not aware of, and kissed them. He lay on his side, she on hers, and hugged her in the form he slept in on that shitty garage armchair. She was right about it being ugly, and he'd toss it if she told him to again. He quit his job and traveled, it, traveled, traveled the globe to the places she used to go on about. She used to talk his ear off to the point he preferred silence. Right now, her, hey, I don't know. Sounded sweeter than whatever he ordered was on hold or in the mail on its way. He posed questions inwardly, whatever could spur another word from her lips, but her closeness erased them as soon as they formed. What had his wife withered into? Her boniness repulsed him. His thoughts came in clear. I wish you would talk to me, she said. I know. I wish you would talk to someone. I know. The phone was ringing. He asked, aren't you going to answer that? You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. He spoke to the back of her head, the small mass of unwashed hair. He kissed it. She asked, do you think I'm cheating on you? No. Are you? No. He kissed it again. At least you're talking to someone. You don't even know who it is. She inched away from him, inched away from him, turning onto her back. Her eyes were about all that remained unchanged, still vibrant within their craters. She said, I know you spend your nights at the strip club. Oh, do you think I'm cheating on you? No, are you? No, how did you know? The eyes locked with his how they would when he locked the keys in the car. Or when he insisted he knew how to get someplace and insisted on referring to his memory. She said, before you stopped sleeping in your own home, you know, when you slept on the couch, your pockets had receipts in them sometimes. Where you going? Kemp? Yeah, does he hate me? He brushed his fingertips over her forearm, her wrist, her ring finger missing its ring. 
She said it fell off. It's in the dresser. Yeah, well, you should talk to Kemp. I want to tell him I'm sorry. Well, maybe you should. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. She stole his words. If he could speak, he would say he was too, like when they were younger, when she used to be sober and he was kinder, as the song sang. He swore her belly was fuller last Thursday. She had said, our child would be a little you, a little me, a you me, a we, a we me. He echoed her, we me. The more they echoed, the harder they laughed, and the harder it was to say. He said it now, we me. She sobbed in his silence and said, how long has it been? I missed hearing you. We, me, he said, until the floor gave way from all the heaps. Fucking Apple, show me some software updates. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I'm never getting an iPhone. <laughs> she sobbed in his silence and said, how long has it been? I missed hearing you. We, me, he said, until the floor gave way from all the heaps of unworn and discarded artifacts and the shoe boxes of fossils. And she held him too. I want another son. I don't want another son. I'm ready now. I thought about it. I'm not ready. How could you want to replace him? I don't. How can you live this way? I can't. How could you fit him into a room, into a closet, into storage? We, me, I still feel him. I swear I've seen him running around. I heard him last night between waking up. Did you hear that? I hear that fucking cat. I won't shut up. Just get out. Get the fuck out. I don't even recognize you anymore. I don't know you. I don't want to know you. Take it with me. Next day, last chapter. Take the next few minutes to undress and put on the gown. Open part on the back. You can leave your underwear on, and the doctor will be with you shortly. The door closed. Rudy raised his eyebrows. Would you like any help? She looked at him like she might a child walking manners. <laughs> her jeans hung off her hip bones so that when she unbuttoned them, they dropped to her ankles. Damn, he said, you're not wasting any time. I haven't put on any music. The sight of this and his joking spurred a vibration through her stomach, and it was something of a laugh, but also a wheeze, and then a song. She covered her face, and the crying started without her. He had his wife. You're going to be okay. What if I'm not? He kissed the crown of her head, her face pressed into his chest. He said, I don't know what's happening. I don't have the answers, but I gotta say it's nice seeing your legs again. Even when I look like Skeletor? Yeah, even when you look like Skeletor. He hugged her tighter. Okay, I know I gained some weight here and there, and you've lost some, but seriously, my hands almost reach your shoulders. I feel like a bare only child right now. She laughed into him. Are your bones shrinking? A knock reached the door then, it opened. The doctor poked his head in. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Rudy said, sorry doc, just have a moment. Take your time, and the door shut. They both looked down at their feet. Her jeans were lumped around her ankles. Rudy asked, would it help if I dropped mine too? He collected her clothes as she undressed and slipped into the blue dotted gown. She sat on the exam table. The cold metal edge of the fabric tucked in touched her thighs. She felt like a body at the morgue. Which of us would go first, she thought. He said, see if they'll uh, sign off on a green card. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we're on a license. You know, we can get high later, like back in college, you know? We'll hit up Playa for luncheons, maybe we'll play the double feature, the driving past Bottle Junction. You know, we can make out in the back seat, drive out further, go to an old spot in the hills of Stargaze. You know what a green car is, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, I, I know. You know you'd be all over me for saying something wrong like that. He stared at her clothes in his lap and smirked, yeah, you're right, I would. It's just a marijuana license, right? Yeah, I think so. It'll be legal here soon anyway. <laughs> He said it's cooler when it's not legal. <laughs> he cradled her leftovers how she might um, he cradled her leftovers how she imagined he would any fossil of hers the moment before giving her eulogy. He used to be the weaker half. 
When did that change? He used to be so angry about everything. And her method of calming him down or distilling an argument was saying a word, the manner of a toddler, the word unfair, now said as unfair. And if that didn't work, she could flash a nipple, a technique which turned into an unspoken agreement. Somewhere down the line where if they found themselves trapped in an inescapable argument, the first person to realize it, realize it would begin stripping, and the other person would follow suit until they both stood there naked, unable to argue. So they'd start laughing and kissing and hammer each other with the floor or the mattress or whatever nearby surface. The old spot in the hills past Bobby Junction, specifically the back seat of his now long gone pickup truck, became a favorite nearby surface of hers. The leather on her bare ass with him between her legs, his mouth on her neck, and they lay there collecting their breath. And he'd point out the Sagittarius constellation and move his index finger up an inch or so and say, there's the center of our galaxy. Or in the summer, he'd point to the Virgo constellation and say, there's a galaxy there with a hundred trillion stars. It looks like the yolk and the white of an egg you just cracked out of the pan. As big as it is, it's 500 times less dense than water. And even though we're just now doing decent photos of it with Hubble, we discovered it in the 1700s. He'd go on the same way he went on with their first ultrasound, with the first photo they got to take home with them. That's our child, he said, the same way he would in their spot in the hills. The James Webb Space Telescope, that's going to be the greatest. We'll be able to see past the gas clouds, see inside star nurseries, see what it looks like for a star in utero, so to speak. Like seen inside the pregnant belly of the cosmos. On their second or third date, she would have insisted that he explain why he cared so much about these things light years out of his reach. But enough nights out there would be on city limits with him, unclothed and cooling off, she knew there was no clear reason. She loved what she loved, too. Thank you.